I'm Eleanor Wachtel, and I'm speaking with Valgina Mort about her winning collection, Music for the Dead and Resurrected. Congratulations. Thank you so much, Eleanor. You started playing the accordion when you were six years old. Was that your first encounter with music? Uh, well, my grandmother sang to me my whole childhood. Uh, but when I was in first grade, um, uh, after I would finish my lessons in uh, school, um, I would wait for my grandma to pick me up uh, by the classroom. Uh, and at that time, the classroom would be occupied by this old man, a uh, World War II veteran, who was giving music lessons to children. And he played accordion and bayan, which is a button accordion. And uh, as I later learned, he had no ear for music, <laughs> no rhythm. <laughs> um, but um, I got, I would peep into the hole of the doorway, of the door. And uh, he opened the door and said, well, how, how many times would you stand here, eavesdropping? Come in and here's an accordion for you try it and he had this screwdriver as i write in one of the poems okay. and with that screwdriver he banged on the um table on the desk doing the rhythm um without any rhythm um and so <laughs> and that's how i got myself into music lessons and my grandmother was extremely excited as it turned out, she tried to uh, force my mother at one point to take accordion lessons, but my mother knew better and resisted. Uh, but I got caught up in it. And um, so I'm somebody who has no ear for music, who was taught music by a man uh, who had no ear for music. And, <laughs> and then I proceeded to enter a music school and there was a system of music schools in the Soviet Union where my teacher, a professional music teacher this time named Svetlana, uh, did not know what to do with me uh, because she thought that I was already so ruined for music by this old man and by my natural absence of musical talent. <laughs> <laughs> so it was always a battle, uh, uh, but an interesting one, yeah. <laughs> but, but you also sang in the chorus at the Opera House in your hometown of Minsk. Um, well, yeah, um, there is a wonderful Opera House in Minsk. It's actually one of the only buildings that survived World War II bombings of Minsk. And during World War II, Germans did not destroy it because they used it for their administration offices. And uh, the place where there was a stage was used as a stable for the horses. So it's a, a building with history. We could see bullet holes in the walls. By now it has been restored. But when I was a child, we loved putting our fingers into the bullet holes. And uh, at one point when I was a child, there was a young theater director who decided to revamp the repertoire. And uh, she started with Carmen, a crowd pleaser. <laughs> and she decided to take children uh, for the children choir. And they put in, uh, you know, naively, they put an ad in a newspaper the children are welcome for additions to the opera theater. And a lot of children additioned, so did I. Um, and uh, um, I have, again, no, no ear for music and a horrible singing voice. But these wonderful people at the opera theater were so moved that so many children came and wanted to be part of the opera house that they decided not to deny, not to reject anybody. So uh, in a way, I am that kind of a product of that no child left behind in the <laughs> <laughs> policy of the Minsk Opera House. They took everybody. And that's how I made my way 
into the opera house and I sang for many years in Carmen, in Elanta, in Queen of Spade, wherever they needed little children from time to time. Mostly I stayed because I was petite, I was short. And so a lot of children grew and they, they did not fit into the role of children anymore. But I was small and experienced with being on stage. So I just stayed forever. And uh, the, our um, choir master would tell me not to, not to sing, just to open my mouth, you know, <laughs> and to watch, <laughs> to watch all the little ones, to watch all the little ones who are singing. Uh, but the opera experience is very formative and moving for me, you know, the, the darkness of the theater, the dust of the stage, the smell of the costumes, the uh, storage room where decorations were kept, where we would, as kids, would make our ventures into, into the dark, in the dark, and you walk through and all of these huge decorations rise over you um yeah it's uh it that was my childhood in the opera house but your grandmother's desire for your mother to play a, a recording or um, involve herself in music and for you to be musical there there's a reason behind that can you talk a little about what what drove her why did she want and, and you played for 10 years i mean she was so determined that uh you <laughs> with you yeah, you know, I was a child who didn't know how to disobey. So my childhood and early adolescence was shaped by music. Um, and music practice occupied most of my time. That's why I learned my poetic discipline, because I think that art is so much about discipline, whatever it is. Um, so, but later, you know, as I was trying to shrink myself a little bit to, to analyze myself and, and my grandma and where, and I thought, where does this obsession with music come from? And I remembered those daily stories that my grandmother would tell me. Uh, uh, she always called them uh, humbly the story of her life and <laughs> and the story of her life would uh, begin uh, with um, uh, whatever the earliest memories and they included uh, her, the memories of her father who died when she was very young uh, in action um, over Western Belarus, um, that so that was a war uh, between this uh, Russian government and Poland for the territories of Western Belarus. So he was not much of a military man at all. He was a farmer who uh, loved music and he made musical instruments himself and pride, took great pride in knowing how to play a little bit of everything and sing to her. And she was quite obsessed, uh, or rather she really held on to the memory of him singing to her. And so um, uh, what, uh, for my grandma, what made a human was, the, the, was musicality. Can you sing? Can you play an instrument? If you can, she looked up to you immediately. She thought that this is something to respect, that there is something special about the musical person. And, um, and so um, I realized at one point, only of course in my adulthood, never in my childhood or adolescence, that this man that I never met and uh, this man that even my grandmother spent so little time with, uh, physically because but, he died he died so young and when because, she was so young yeah 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 though but he occupied right so much of her mental space and her psychic space her inner life that he made his way into my inner life too and not only into my inner life but also into my physical existence through this music practice, particularly also because accordion is a very physical instrument. You hug it, you know, and it weighs on you, particularly as you're a small child, you feel its weight. It's a heavy instrument. And I was so small and the instrument we had was too large for me. So the belts that go around your shoulders 
did not fit me. They were too large. So my grandma had to tie them in my back. Um, so it was always quite an operation where she would literally tie me to the accordion. And, um, but then uh, the accordion I had was black, but when I played, the bellows would open and inside they were bright red. And there's something of a, a beautiful insect, I think, about it. Or perhaps by one, I think of a butterfly that opens, right? Is all camouflaged and dark on the outside, but when it opens its wings, it reveals this bright color. Uh, I don't know what it attracts. Uh, what does accordion attract in our case? Um, the dead, the ghosts, <laughs> memory, right? It heals something. Could you read your poem, Music Practice? Yeah, with pleasure. You see, I'm quite a talker. <laughs> <laughs> I apologize. I know no, that. No, not at all. Things. There are a lot of stories. <laughs> Music Practice. In the intermission between two wars, your father sang a song. By the time I heard this song, it had no music. Patching the lyrics with mmm and ah. After the third war, you got by as a seamstress. You lost the thread of melody and pitch. This song, my daily dose of radiation or vaccination, without words, except for off-key mooing, except for low-key bleating, this song limping through the lump in the throat, my dead, always peeping, toming, always pack-pocketing my small girl brain. Should I go ahead and profess that in the name of that man who played any instrument thrown at him, a cymbal and a mandal and a fiddle, but ended up quickly killable once thrown into a war, not even a great one at that, I was drafted into music. Because your sole memory of your father was a man singing a tune in the gooseberry yard to a toddler who later could remember neither words nor melody. I had to Lauren Bach, Brahms, Rachmaninoff, Hayden on a red accordion. I had to put in over 32,000 hours of music practice. Not unlike the Nazis on your dainty wristwatch, you meticulously kept track of my every sitting, subtracted trips to the bathroom, carried out under your disapproving, suspecting gaze. I had neither ear nor voice for it, neither did you, I would add, since now you cannot contradict me. What can a toddler mouth full of gooseberries understand about a song? What could a tongue remember after loss and hunger? If I didn't know how we are made, I'd say you had no father at all. His song sounds too improbable. It goes, mm, and ah, without melody, without music. All there is to it is your sad face that goes mm, and ah, to Bach, Brahms, Rachmaninoff. You're, you've said that it, it was listening, you're, you're, you're uh, self-deprecating in terms of your connection to music, but you're, it seems that very early on you did have a connection to music. You described how the radio was on all the time playing classical music and it was music that helped you cope with your, what your grandmother was telling you because she wasn't exactly telling you stories but recounting family history of death and survival. I mean, what did you make of this as a young child? You know, it was all a fairy tale. And I think that's what I still write fairy tales. Uh, it seems so surreal and unreal and ahistorical. She always insisted um, that history is, is something that happens to somebody else. 
Um, and if it was not history, the, what was it? A kind of a fairy tale, fairy tale music. And in this fo poem, I um, self-deprecate a bit, saying that this man died between the two proper wars, right? The world would one and the world war two and could not wait a little bit to die in the great war which for us in, is the world war two which means that when i was in school when where the world war two was our biggest national pride and myth i did not have my proper war veteran i had to make up imaginary grandfather who could have died in world war two but i didn't have one Mine died in a war that we kind of brushed over in school. It was unimportant. And he was a great grandfather, so he was even once more removed. Yes, yes exactly. So uh, there's, um, uh, and um, uh, now, now I forgot a little bit uh, the question. You're saying... What, with, what, you, what you made of these, these stories of, of, of yeah. tragedy, really, within the family and... Yeah, it's, you know, I I was a, a very good listener. I thought I didn't know another way of being. Um, and so my grandmother molded me into the, the perfect listener of her story. She, um, uh, one could say that she just fed me with it, stored her story in me, impregnated me with the story uh, and um, made sure that I remembered. And later on, I start, when I started writing poems and publishing, and she knew that some of my poems had to do with her, right? That they were about her in some way or addressing her or her stories. It was very important to her. And she um, always wanted to make sure that I do not go one reading without uh, reading those poems, uh, yes, so she wanted to control that part, that part also, and uh, I slowly started kind of um, because once something is put into you, quite passively, you just I was a passive receiver, and once something like that is put into you very passively for a very long time, at at a certain point you are going to take it out, you are going to give birth to it, to release it. And because I do not come from any kind of a literary family, and there was nobody who was a professor or a writer uh, or anything like that, um, and nothing in my life and in my family prepared me for being a writer. For a very long time, I did not understand what I was and what I was doing. So I would say that everything I have written was an attempt to give birth to what has been put into me. Um, but a, a, perhaps it's this third book that truly became the music for the dead of, uh, and re resurrected. It's this third book where I can own up to the fact of what it is and where it comes from because it has taken me three books to say, well, I am indeed a poet. I, I do indeed write. I think I can own up to it now. <laughs> because it, it wasn't just family history, but the history of your country, Belarus, that you were hearing about, which, which seemed to be one tragedy after another. And uh, you, I mean, one of the, your, the poems in, in, in this book, uh, uh, Antigone, a dispatch alludes to the Stalinist purges of, of, the, of the late 1930s. Can you talk a little bit about Kirpati and, and, and what, what happened then and how that inspired you? Yeah, indeed, it's, it's true that somehow the history of Belarus, starting with about 17th century, is the history of one catastrophe after another, with very little peacemaking in between. Because to make any peace with one's history, you have, I think, to have a little bit of well-being <laughs> and living well, right? Your basic needs taken care of so that you could take care of your inner world and of, of, of the inner movement of your psyche. Um, and there was never time for that. 
Um, and so uh, what Belarusians learned is rather to forget and not to think about it mm -hmm. and to deny and actually to think of this catastrophe, this history, because for us, history equals catastrophe uh, as something of a, um, to, to think of it is to guilt oneself. Um, it's a kind of a privilege that means that everything else is taken care of and it was never taken care of. And Kurapati is something that uh, was uh, silenced for many years and something that helps me understand why, uh, in fact, there was nobody to die in World War II in my family. <laughs> because World War II, as it turned out, was not um, the only tragedy, catastrophe in the 20th century for us, not at all, uh, but it, um, uh, the several catastrophes preceded it, and just immediately the 30s, the Stalinist purges, which got rid of, um, it's hard to even say who, because um, uh, the biggest umbrella would be anybody with agency, Every, anybody with a sense of agency um, was seen as risky, was seen as insurgent, was seen as a potential opposer and disruptor. So there was a big case against Belarusian artists who were accused of um, extremism against the Russian um, government, against the Soviet ideology. Uh, the, there is one bloody night in October when over 100 cultural workers were shot without any trials, with all of their manuscripts burnt. Um, and so there's just, it's history and legacy of silence and many, many others that didn't have to be artists, scholars, farmers, shop owners, journalists, professors, teachers, um, anybody with the capacity for critical thinking, anybody with a, a capacity to question government's actions, to say, but I do have a voice, I do have an agency. So these people disappeared into this forest um, where there are mass graves, sites of mass executions. I cannot even call them graves. There are the holes into which, in the ground, into which corpses were piled up. And until today, we do not know how many people are there, why were they killed, who were they? Because still our government, um, uh, denies access to this ground and there is just desire to build a highway over it to build a re restaurant next to it and to deny any kind of um, understanding of who is there and why this is even though it's, it's this is something that happened you know uh, what 90 years ago or, or so I mean and it's the Soviet secret police executing what estimated from 30,000 to a quarter of a million. I mean, the, the numbers are yeah. mind boggling. And nonetheless, this, this kind of Stalinist repression can't be acknowledged at this time in Belarusian history. It cannot because those, what happened 90 years ago is happening now. Uh, it's, it's now, it's not the past that we could, there is no safe distance right now. We're still living in it. And those same institutions that committed those um, atrocities, those inhuman acts, they're still, uh, uh, they're still acting now. They're still legitimate institutions in our country. Um, the NKVD methods, the KGB methods, they're still there. People are still in those cells today. They're kept in the same cells where people were kept 90 years ago. And the same judiciary system is um, putting on those fake 
trials today. And our government today, as is Russian government today, um, takes its origin from that very government. Those ideas are um, that legacy uh, of um, a strong, a strong master of the house uh, are still, uh, pr still prevail and are still lauded. And people who um, speak, speak uh, for uh, that history, for acknowledging that loss and acknowledging for the inhumanity of that system, I've still been silenced. What can a poet do, especially a poet who no longer lives in her home country? Well, what can uh, anybody do? <laughs> As Cheslov Milish was writing in his poem on An Angel, I think he wrote, do whatever you can. <laughs> Yeah, every day, do whatever you can. Uh, a poet um, uh, is not really a political activist. A poet works with, uh, with language. A poet works with a fairy tale. Um, and a poet, but what a poet can do and what a poet reminds us of is a necessity for new language is um, uh, the fact that every day when whatever government, whether Russian, Belarusian or Canadian comes on the radio or on TV and says, we're so sorry, we apologize so sincerely that all of these words are cliches, that this is all dead language and that we repeat dead language every day and function in a dead language. And Po a po the job of a poet, the duty of a poet um, is to try to find language that is free and alive. And um, after each new catastrophe, we have, we are silent until we find a new language of speaking about these things. And we have to reinvent it every time because by reinventing new language, we are confronting and unsettling ourselves. We are reminding ourselves that we should not try to adapt, um, but to uh, rethink and reinvent uh, and to be in discomfort. In your long poem, An Attempt at Genealogy, you write, among my people, only the dead have human faces. In, in, in what way? Uh, well, this um, makes me think of Adam Zagajewski, a great Polish poet, who in his book, Two Cities, uh, writes about totalitarianism and the great sense of loss and what it was like to live under the Soviet system. And, uh, and, uh, he, um, and he says uh, that, uh, I, that he's guilty. He's guilty of many things uh, and he still doesn't know if he's a good person or a bad person. And I think that all of us living until we're truly tested, we do not know <laughs> whether we are good or bad. Uh, and um, um, I think only the dead have that claim on, uh, 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 or because they have completed uh, their, their journey and their tests. And in that way, uh, only they can say, I have been tested and this is how I have behaved. But um, we now, we do not know until we are put to the test. I think that we have um, a very right tendency to think that we are um, uh, civilized people who <laughs> um, are allowed to um, live the way we do, to forget that we are great cowards uh, because we live in a peaceful time. And only when we are unsettled, only when we are tested, uh, we uh, really confront who we are really. 
Another thing that comes up in your work is the Chernobyl nuclear plant explosion that occurred just across the Ukrainian border. Some 70% of radiation fell on Belarus. This is part of the, when you say there's history and it, it's tragic. Yeah. You were very young at the time. How, how did you understand what was happening? I understand it also as a way of a fairy tale. Um, there was an invisible danger uh, there were stories of monsters. There were stories of um, poison that could be in anything that can transform you into a monster. And so there was a sense of great um, tension and nervousness uh, that was always in the air. Uh, but generally for us, um, uh, Chernobyl remains very much an unpro unprocessed catastrophe. And it is a catastrophe that is just one more thing, one more catastrophe in a chain of catastrophes, in many ways, not very different from a war. It was a language of war that was used to talk about Chernobyl. We, um, you know, we sent an army to battle this invisible enemy that occupied our country. Um, and um, we uh, put out fires, um, uh, people died of some kind of pandemic, uh, people mourned loss, people didn't get to see their dead, didn't get to bury them properly. So it was just like another, another war. And I think that um, besides uh, Svetlana Alexievich's uh, book, um, Voices from Chernobyl, it still remains largely unprocessed um, disaster for us. And in fact, in this book, Voices from Chernobyl, uh, Alexievich writes that uh, this catastrophe was not just knowledge, new knowledge, it is a pre-knowledge, she says. This is the future. This is something that we are going to know in the future, but we do not quite understand or know just yet. And uh, we could, I, we, it's really true for, uh, for us in Belarus. We are still to come to terms with this disaster. We still talk about it like it's just another war. It's just another occupation that came from everywhere and we were powerless against it. Because going back to the music, there's a line, a, a daily source of Beethoven, Chernobyl radio station, the joy of radioactive rains is in your poem, Gamma Rays. What? Yeah. <laughs> well, <laughs> there, uh, because it was, you know, the time of when radioactive rains fell on Belarus was for us a joyful time. Um, it was a warm spring, nothing was announced, nobody knew anything. Uh, since uh, our government for the fear of panic decided to hide uh, the, the fact of the explosion from the people. So it's true, people were enjoying as the radio was playing lovely music, um, like Ode to Joy by Beethoven, <laughs> we were indeed joyful and enjoying a warm, a warm spring, uh, first spring rains in which it's wonderful to run when you are a small child. And so we all enjoy it and we all come out of our apartment blocks and raise our faces to, to these rains. And this idea of music here, um, the gamma rays and the gamma, the gamma um, radiation, right? The, um, um, they, they two come together because I'm playing gammas, which is a word for scale, another word for a musical scale. And um, so this is a way, the, the combination of this gamma, gamma rays which is radiation and the gamma musical scale also shows the pairing of these two things uh, through this word gamma shows the way I understand music, not as something acoustic, um, but um, 
as um, the bringing of to the repetition or the echo of these two things that seemingly are unrelated, yet, yet they are uh, related and they come together creating this moment of tension between the gamma rays and the radiation and the child who is practicing her gammas, her music scales, and the radio that is playing Ode to Joy. And all of that comes together to show not re the reality of what is happening, not so much the history of what is happening. This is not what will be written in the Chernobyl disaster Wikipedia page, but this is kind of the uh, psychic movement of our lives. Um, this is how one is being exposed to the radiation. <laughs> when one is enjoying um, these radioactive rains, well, when taking a break from music practice. Thank you so much. It's great to have the chance to talk to you. Thank you so much, Eleanor. It was a pleasure and an honor. Thank you.